Vaše ekselence, dame in gospodje, dragi prijatelji, dovolite mi da vas pozdravim i izrazim dobrodošlicov imenu Mednarodnega inštituta za bližnjo sodne balkanske študije IFIMES iz Ljubljane, ki organizira današnje predavanje pogovor z dr. Elizabeth Merfinger z naslovom Islam, religija zvojevalce, slikovni pogled na islamsko vero. Posebno dobrodošlice in zahvala gre tudi naši današnji gosti z Danje Kanade, vgledni zelo spoštovanji strokovnjakinji, prof. dr. Elizabeth Merfinger. Profesorica Merklinger je avstijsko-kanadska profesorica, ki se je šolala na univerzah Cambridge in Delhi. Se bo v svem predavanju osredotočila na vprašanje islama in islamske arhitekture. Dr. Merklinger je predavala na slovitih univerzah Oxford, Cambridge, Georgetown, Harvard in tako naprej. Vesel sem, da se danes govori o islamu in islamski kulturi, saj je spoznavanje drugih kultur danes še bolj pomembno kot kdajkoli prej. Vse skozi se izpostavlja pomen dialoga, hkrati pa se pozablja, da dialog ni potreben le med narodi, religijami, kulturami in civilizacijami, ampak tudi v družini, šoli, okolju, kateri živimo in delamo. Upam, da bo današnji dogodek skromen prispevek k temu. Predavanje bo poteklo v angliškem jeziku, sledi bo pogovor z dr. Mertlinger, ki ga bo vodila moj kolega, sodirektor Bahtjar Aljav in jaz Zijed Bečirovič. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to welcome you in the name of International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies, IFIMES of, of Ljubljana, the organizing uh, of today's lecture and dis discussion with Dr. Elizabeth Merkinger with title Islam, Religion of the Concourse of Visual Exploration. A special welcome and gratitude goes uh, to our guest today from for Hawaii, uh, Canada, the acclimate and highly respect for expert Professor Dr. Elizabeth Merklinger. I wish Dr. Merklinger a pleasant stay in our wonderful country. Thank you. Dr. Elizabeth Merklinger, an Austrian-Canadian professor who studied at the universities of Cambridge and Delhi, will deliver a lecture on the Islam and Islam architect. Dr. Merlinger was uh, lec lecturing uh, at universities of Oxford, Oxford, Cambridge, Georgetown, Harvard, etc. I'm, uh, I am uh, glad uh, that today we speak of Islam and Islamic architecture. Uh, after all, we need dialogue now more than ever uh, and uh, knowledge about other cultures. Uh, we often forget that dialogue is not only important between nations, religions, cultures, and civilization, but also in families, schools, in the environment in which we live and work. I hope that today's event will be a humble contribution to this dialogue. Uh, the lecture will be given the English language. It will uh, uh, follow by a discussion with Dr. Mellinger, uh, moderated by my colleague Bakhter Aljaf and myself, Zied Bucirovic. Before I give uh, the floor to Dr. Melkinger. I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Aljaf, uh, co-director of our institute, who will assist me during this uh, lecture. If you the floor, Dr. Elizabeth Melkinger. Thank you very much. Islam. Ornament. And it's Islam. Oh, wait, no, that. This one? You want the PowerPoint. Yeah, but I need it on the slide. On the slide show. Well, can we put it on the slide, slideshow? Which is slideshow? It's in it's in Slovenian. First. Yeah, but I want second. I want slideshow. Yeah, I want slideshow. You have to just got the check at the No, no. Uh -huh. 
That's it. Thank it's you. good. <laughs> but um, did you have a pointer? Uh, this is no, no. Uh, no, all right. Well, that's all right. Sorry. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, the lecture today is about um, Islam, the religion, rather than architecture, which is what I usually concern myself with. But um, <clears throat> I thought that I would show you uh, in pictures um, what Islam is all about. Now, um, are you going to leave the lights like this? Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you see the... For uh, much of the past 1,300 years, Europeans have regarded Islam as a menace. How did the Europeans look at Islam? So Christians felt uh, that this was a strange religion. It was so similar to Christianity, yet there was one God, there was a, uh, a universe, but there was a denial of the doctrine of the Trinity. So Jesus is accepted as a prophet, even that he was born of a virgin, but it's denied that he was divine or that he was crucified. Here is a religion that believes in a day of judgment and heaven and hell, but it makes, it seems to make heaven's rewards the chief achievement. Here's a religion that regarded the Christian Bible as the word of God, but gave a supreme authority to a book called the Quran. That was for them the word of God. So, uh, Christian states have felt threatened by Muslim power, which, as you know, penetrated to the heart of France in the 8th century, probed the deaths of Central Asia, of, of Central Europe, sorry, in the 16th and 17th century, and for nearly a thousand years patrolled the southern and eastern flanks of Christendom. Even in the 18th and 19th century, uh, when European power was spread throughout the world, Muslims were still seen to be a danger. And this hasn't changed today. So European attitudes about Islam were hostile. The early Europeans were cut off from the main centers of the Muslim civilization by the Byzantine Empire. And so they built all sorts of vague and fantastic pictures of what Islam was really like. In, in, in one um, story, they said the prophet was a sorcerer and that he had horns, etc. This is the stories that came down. And it was only from the 12th century on, from when the, the uh, Quran was translated into Latin, that a more serious appreciation of Islam began. In fact, Dante called Muhammad a false prophet and assigned him to a very severe punishment in the ninth of his ten gloomy ditches. So in the 18th century, a real fear began uh, with the Ottoman threat. And a European began to perceive uh, <clears throat> this, this threat of Islam. And um, this wasn't helped at all by the French invasion of Egypt in 1798 and the British conquest of Mysore, which was the last hostile Indian Muslim stronghold in 1799. But confidence, uh, European confidence began to grow in the 19th century, and the Russians and the Dutch joined the British and French in bringing around the Muslim peoples under their control. And by 1920, by the Treaty of San Remo, more than three quarters of the Muslim world was under European sway. 
So we can see prejudices um, in such pictures as the one on the wall. This was done by Renoir um, early on. Uh, in fact, it was done. It was done in 1870, nine years before he visited Algiers. He'd never seen um, uh, an odalisk such as this one, but he portrayed it. And here we see sex, violence, and fanaticism. And this has traditionally filled a large part of the European image of the Islamic world. The, the sensuality just seems to ooze from this languorous Algerian odalisk. And as you know, the harem and its delights were a frequent resort for the imagination of 19th century painters and writers in Europe. European appetites were whetted by travelers' tales. Uh, there were the Arabian Nights and all that had to offer, caliphs, viziers, slaves, genies, lamps, fabulous happenings. And um, now this world became an exotic realm in which Europeans could explore new possibilities. We have Montesquieu and his Persian letters, Mozart writing the abduction from the Seraglio, Goethe, the West Easterly Divan. It became a world in which Europeans traveled, mainly in search of themselves. There was Lady Hester Stanhope, who uh, gloried as she entered Palmyra through the triumphal arch and pitched her tent amidst thousands of Bedouin. There was T.E. Lawrence, who never got over the excitement of Arabs, camels, and the war in the desert. Now, I'll not get into politics in any way, but the old fear of Islam has in many ways reasserted itself in our day, of course. Uh, we build up stories, um, holy wars. Um, in the 19th century, Islam was for Europe uh, a religion of violence. So quite Quickly, I'd like to <clears throat> look at the first nine centuries of uh, Islam from 622 to 1500. Um, <clears throat> when uh, the faith of Islam began around 610, when Muhammad, um, the son of a Meccan merchant, had a vision, and the angel Gabriel came to him in the vision and transmitted messages from God. These messages form the Quran. <clears throat> Inspired by these messages, Muhammad began to preach to the people of Mecca, uh, exhorted them to give up their idols and to submit to the one and invisible God. They provoked much hostility and had to flee Mecca, and in 622 went to Medina, a city somewhat northeast of Mecca. And from this date dates the Hijra, the Muslim calendar, 622. So from this date on, the Muslims made 622 the first year of the Islamic era. And Medina, uh, and Muhammad became the ruler of Medina and um, died in 632. He'd given to the nomads and the townspeople of Medina a faith in one God and a book of revelations which he believed pointed the way to a superior life. So what do Muslims believe? They believe that Muhammad was the last of the gods, uh, uh, sorry, the last of God's prophets. He seemed to complete the work started by the great Hebrew prophets, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, in showing the way to a true monotheism. He called the faith Islam, which means submitting to God. Muslims were those who submitted, and the community of Muslims were those who accepted God's final revelation.
Fired by this new faith, the Muslims exploded out of the Western Arabia and within a few years had arranged the, rearranged the political map of the Mediterranean. Uh, they had conquered the rest of Arabia, Palestine, eight years later, the Byzantine and Sasanian empires, Syria, Iraq, Western Iran, and Egypt. And by the middle of the seventh century, Muslim armies advanced in the West, the Caucasus, Oxus, the Hindu Kush, and the East. By 712, they reached Central Asia and uh, North Africa in 709, advanced through Spain to France, Poitiers in 732. So they had an enormous empire which stretched all the way to the Pyrenees in the west. Skipping now over more than 1,200 years of history, in recent years, Muslims have started to reassert Islamic values, as you know, and the Islamic vision. And they started to believe that the aims of Islam and those of the West were totally opposed. So we have Egypt, of course, in the forefront with Nasser in 1967. I won't go into uh, such details now, but uh, we have also Anwar Sadat, who developed the policy of returning to Islam and uh, built up support against uh, communism. He was seen regularly on his knees Fridays at prayer. The Sharia became the main source of legislation and big concessions were made. In 1969, in Libya, an army coup established fundamentalism under uh, Gaddafi, where, uh, as you all know, uh, alcohol was forbidden and um, every, all the street signs were in Arabic, among other things. And then there was the revolution in Iraq here in 19, sorry, in Iran here in 1978-79, the most sudden and powerful attempt to break Western secular mold when um, the Shah um, was uh, forced to abdicate and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini emerged as the strongest man and led uh, the revolution. And here we see five million Iranians flooding the central square where the Shah was celebrating 2,500 years of Iranian uh, monarchy. The Iranian, can you see that all right on the wall? The Iranian revolution produced some striking posters. Here Ayatollah Khomeini as Moses is victorious over the Shah as Pharaoh. I'm sorry, I don't have a a pointer, mm -hmm. who clings on to the coattails of American imperialism allied to the Israeli state. Is there any way of shutting one of those? Yes, mm -hmm. Can't see. It. Can they see? It? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. So <clears throat> let's have a look to see about the religion of Islam and what it really means. There are five pillars or fundamental observances of Islam. The first is the creed, and that means belief in God, his angel, his books, his prophets. It's widely agreed that anyone who utters the shahada, the testimony, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is the prophet of God, may be regarded as a Muslim. This is the minimum of Muslim belief. And the creed, Allah, is written here that you can see on the screen. It's from the mausoleum of Ali from Samarkand. And here we have Allah written. Uh, are you going just, to Yeah, just press this laser ah, button. Wonderful. There is a oh, small thank you. Thank you very much. You have the script, and uh, it makes it um, uh, a very... Uh, a good indeed. The script also here in from Herat, from um, Gaur Shad, where again you have the prophet, the God's name. 
and from the Shai Zinda, again, were decoration of the script on the side. So the, the, the name of Allah is very often found on Muslim uh, monuments. Islam also has angels. Since God was beyond all physical perception, angels are needed to bring his messages to men. It was Gabriel who communicated the Quran to Muhammad and Gabriel who announced the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary. So here we see these angels. They're called recording angels. And this is from a manuscript of al Katswini, uh, The Wonders of Creation, done in Iraq in 1280. Um, <clears throat> the Muslims believe they are attended by two recording angels, one to take note of their good deeds, the other to note the bad ones. All Muslims have guardian angels, and eight angels support the throne of God, and 19 <clears throat> are in charge of hell. Now, angels are inferior to prophets because in the Quran, all of them were commanded to prostrate themselves before Adam. Now, there are in Islam prophets. These are the men who received God's message from the angels. So the angels had the message and they gave them to the prophets. They um, <clears throat> didn't work miracles except when God enabled them to do so as a sign. The Quran mentions 28 prophets. Uh, 21 also appear in the Bible. Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, Jacob, Job, Moses and Jesus among others. Particular stress is laid on Jesus' immaculate conception and his miracles, although the Quran denies Jesus' divinity. Muhammad is, of course, the seal of the prophets, and his message is for all men. Muslims share many prophets uh, with Jews and Christians. In this miniature, from the history of Hafiz Abru, painted in Herat in 1425, Moses and the Israelites watch the Pharaoh and his host drown in the Red Sea. The Quran names um, the scriptures of Abraham, the Torah of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Gospel of Jesus as books revealed by God. Now on the last day, the trumpet will sound, the last judgment, when men will be raised from the dead and called to account. Here we see the Archangel Asraphil sounding the last trumpet on the day of judgment. This miniature was painted in Iraq in 1370. So those who believe the messages of the prophets and have struggled to follow God's paths will be summoned to enter paradise where they will live forever in a garden with cool streams, beautiful women, couches adorned with silk, flowing cups, and luscious fruit. Here we have a charming vision, Muslim vision, of heaven where the blessed are seen in a beautiful garden exchanging nosegays of flowers. This is from the uh, Miraj Name, The Miraculous Journey of Muhammad, 15th century Herat. Now, um, ultimate reward will be the sight of God, but those who have ignored messages and followed other gods will be cast into hell where they will be burned or uh, made to drink boiling, boiling water. So here we see such a hellfire, no less fierce for Muslims than for Christians. This painting is also from Herat, from the Miraj Name, and depicts the fate of an adulterous woman. The second pillar of Islam is the Quran, is, is prayer, and of course the Quran is the most important point of this, and um, all the power of an artist goes into making beautiful Qurans, and such is the one that you have on the screen here, which is done in Kufic, and it's an 11th century uh, um, Quran. 
The Quran, how does the Muslim regard the Quran and what part does it play in his daily life? He believes that the Quran is the word of God, the expression of divine will, revelation. The revelation was a miracle. Uh, so this was the last word before the day of judgment. So that the Quran is thus the supreme authority for all mankind, the only road to salvation. It's the measure of truth and the best model for conduct. When Muhammad received the revelation, he ascended to heaven, and it said on a single, uh, on a winged creature, half human, half horse, known as Burak. And this event came to play an important part in the biography of Muhammad, which was collected by the ninth century. The Quran accompanies a believer throughout his life. He begins to learn it as a child, as he begins to talk. And here these boys are learning the Quran in Oman. For Muslims, the Quran is the fundamental law, the treasure, the mirror of the ages. The words are to be remembered with the utmost precision. They are to be copied in the fairest hand. The book is to be made as beautiful as possible. Its pages, its covers, its binding is an opportunity for the craftsman to praise God through his art. Hence the beauty of Islamic art. This again is an early Kufic script, 10th century from Quran. Now one of the attractions of Islam to the Byzantine provinces was its simplicity. The, they were used to these Byzantine um, complexities. And here we have a simple religion. The affirmation of God's unity, prayer five times a day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, almsgiving, and a pilgrimage together, together with certain light dietary requirements. Prayer, then, uh, how does prayer, how is prayer prescribed? Five times a day, more if you wish. Extra prayer is encouraged, as is communal prayer on Friday, uh, which should be for men in congregation and should be led by the chief Muslim of the uh, locality, who also delivers the sermon. So how does the prayer work? The muezzin is the man who calls the Muslims to prayer, and he calls God is most great, four times in Arabic. I bear witness that there is no God but God, twice. I bear witness that Muhammad is God's messenger, twice. Come to prayer, twice. Come to success, twice. God is most great, twice. There is no God but God. And here you see such a muezzin. The prayer is generally made from the minaret, but these days it's often made from a roof. On hearing this, the Muslim prepares for prayer, and such as this old man in the um, crossing the courtyard of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, uh, and he holds his shoes in his hand. As you can see, the earliest surviving monumental mosque here of the Islamic world, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, makes his way to ablutions before prayer. And um, he takes off the shoes, leaves them at the entrance, carries them to be placed with their souls together. Then he washes himself, symbolically expressing his desire for inner cleanliness as he removes the dirt from his body. First he must wash his hands and his wrists three times, then rinse out his mouth and nostrils and wash face and arms up to the elbow each action being performed three times. Then he draws his hands over his head, ears, and neck, and washes his feet up to the ankles three times. Then he joins the lines of his fellow Muslims facing Mecca and waits for the imam to give the signal for prayers to begin. 
He orients himself towards Mecca, the direction which is indicated in a mosque by the mihrab, the niche which faces Mecca. Then he performs a number of rakats or bowing, such as you see here, prescribed for the prayer. Each bowing consisting of a sequence of seven movements. And he prostrates himself. And at the end, uh, he, uh, as you see, prostrates himself to the ground and sits back on his haunches. And as he performs a cycle of prayer, his whole body expresses the words he utters, glory be to the Lord the Great. So he has to be in an attitude of humility and devotion or it doesn't count. Now the next, um, <clears throat> the next enjoined is uh, almsgiving. A Muslim has to give part of his wealth to the poor. There is also fasting, which is required in the ninth month of the lunar year, Ramadan, uh, when he has to abstain during daylight hours. And finally, there is the pilgrimage to Mecca, if you can possibly do it, if you are um, physically able to do it. All Muslims must perform at least once in their lifetime, and this is a pilgrimage caravan, which was a joyous occasion. Pilgrims were going to represent themselves to God. This scene is from the Makamat of Al-Harari, painted in Baghdad in 1237, and shows a pilgrim caravan accompanied by the music of trumpets and kettle drums. Even the Prophet and Abu Bakr were made to go on pilgrimage, and here you see them uh, in the life of the Prophet, 1594. The Prophet, of course, is never shown, his face is never shown. It's always covered in, um, it, he's always painted uh, in white. And then here you see the pilgrims wearing their ihram just before their ship docks at Jeddah. Women need to wear any, uh, don't need to wear any particular dress, and in contrast with what might be their custom, they go unveiled. And then with others, uh, they, um, they walk around the central sanctuary, and the center of the faith is this black square stone called the Kaaba, which marks the site where Ishmael, the legendary father of the Arabs, worshiped the black stone given to him by the angel Gabriel. Here is a 15th century manuscript with the Kaaba, a pilgrim scroll. The pilgrim makes seven circuits of the Kaaba, it's, uh, and uh, then runs seven times from Mecca towards Marwa and back, recalling the desperate search for water for her son Ishmael by Hagar, Abraham's wife. And then he sets out for the plain of Arafat. From noon to dark, he stands before God and worships him. This vast concourse you see is on the plain of Arafat, where a tented city is erected by the Saudi government to protect pilgrims from the sun. And then he sacrifices an animal, and there are various um, other matters uh, that he does to finish. But it plays such an important part in the life of a Muslim that here we have a Sudanese house and the proud owner showing his pilgrimage on the wall. Now, what does a mosque look like? It's, uh, a mosque is a large courtyard surrounded by high walls. Um, and in the interior of the prayer hall, um, such as here, we have a forest of pillars are replacing the earlier palm trees. And it's a characteristic. The floor is covered with carpets, as you see. And um, it usually has a minaret, such as this one. This is the beautiful, beautiful minaret from Cairo, from Ibn Tulun. And from here, the call to prayer is made five times a day. Early minarets were solid square towers, but then some of them uh, became uh, round as here. 
In the center of the courtyard is a fountain of running water for ceremonial ablutions, often with seats around them. This, again, is from a, a beautiful mosque in Cairo, the Sultan Hassan Mosque, built between 1356 and 62. It's one of the finest medieval buildings in the city. The, the direction to Mecca is shown inside, since all Muslims worship is conducted by the people facing in that manner. And this is normally shown by um, <coughs> the mihrab, which faces Mecca, and the dikkah from where the sermon is uh, read. The mihrab is considered the most sacred part of um, the knees. And the uh, flight of steps here on which the preacher either stands or sits. You'll notice no reading desk, uh, which we're used to from, this is because traditionally the preacher shouldn't read his sermon. And uh, the, then uh, the third piece of furniture found in most Arab mosques is a dikkah or raised platform, such as here. And um, from this, the final call to prayer is made by the muezzin just before the worship service begins. Decoration is limited, very limited in a mosque. It's generally on the mihrab, such as here. This is a beautiful mihrab from Kashan, 1226, um, exquisitely door, uh, ornamented. This is from Turbadi Sheikh Jam, the mid 14th century, uh, in stucco. Again, you see the use of script uh, and arabesque, the floral, um, floral scrolls, etc and the script and the floral in between. And it's this decoration which makes Muslim architecture so very beautiful. Otherwise, there's very little decoration. There are, uh, in addition to the mihrabs, we have decoration in the windows, such as here. These window grills, um, sometimes on doors, such as in El Hakim. And of course, on the dome, such as here in the Shah Zinda, which is found in many, though not all, mosques. The dome usually covers the most important part of the mosque, either the central section of the prayer hall or the tomb of the founder of the mosque. And decoration on, on the minaret, such as this wonderful one from Al Azhar from 14th century Cairo. Now, I'd like, uh, lastly, to just mention briefly a question which has plagued Islam from the earliest days to now and hasn't been solved because when Muhammad died, he left behind a dilemma concerning the successor. After the first three successors, um, who'd been involved with Muhammad as relatives or friends, a conflict erupted which split the Islamic world and divides it still. There were two groups. Should the next uh, be, should the fourth successor be Ali's son-in-law, the prophet, or uh, a, a relatively unknown man from the community? Uh, so the adherents of secular power won, and they became known as Sunnis, or Orthodox sect of Islam, and about 90% of all Muslims are Sunnis. And these are the ones where decisions are made through the consensus of a body of men known as the ulama, the, uh, the leaders of the Sunni community. The fourth leader chose the title of caliph, and he passed his title on to uh, a relative the, from the Umayyad family. Those who lost were the Shia, but they never really lost. And in, in throughout history, they um, took over power, sometimes in Egypt, sometimes in Iran. The Aga Khan heads one sect of the partisans of Ali, known as the Ismailis. So um, <clears throat> the belief, what, what was the main belief of the Shia? It was that 
Along with the exoteric interpretation of the Quran, there was a secret interpretation which had been transmitted from Muhammad to Ali and from Ali to his heir. So uh, the only real successors were those who had this secret knowledge transmitted, and they were designated imam, or leaders of the community. Gradually, the imams were raised to superhuman status, which were expressed in the belief that they were infallible and without sin. An offshoot of the Shia are the Ismailis, who regard Ismail as the seventh imam. And an offshoot of theirs are the assassins of the Middle Ages. The Aga Khan is a descendant of the assassins. The most important Shia sect is known as the Twelvers, or Imamites, who form a large community to this day, mostly in Persia and Iraq, and recognize 12 Imams, which ends with the Mahdi, who disappeared in 1880. The stronghold of the Twelvers was Persia, and uh, Ali, uh, the Prophet's son-in-law, and his daughter Fatima, or considered divine, as were the Imam and their martyred son, Hassan and Hussein. The pilgrimage to the tombs of the Imam and to um, uh, Hassan and Hussein's tomb were considered just as important uh, as, the, the, uh, as the Meccan journey for the Sunnis. So I'd like to end by showing, sorry, I'd like to end, uh, end by showing you uh, the inside of the shrine of the eighth Imam himself, Imam Ritza at Meshed. Here pilgrims pass through the chambers of glittering a mirror work and tile to reach the tomb of Imam Ritza at the end of the passage, hung with crystal chandeliers. Rooms are filled with people praying and reading the Quran. The sick are brought here for help in the hope that they'll receive power uh, of the of Imam Ritza and will be cured. And this is the, uh, sorry. I can't go back. So anyhow, I've missed here the shrine of Fatima. But here you see the hands and lips of each pilgrim in the shrine of Fatima, the sister of the eighth Imam, touching the precious grill covering the tomb of Iman Ritza. So you can see this is very, very important um, for the Shia. But not everything in Islam is dogma. In the gardens of the Hafizia in Shiraz, where the 14th century poet Hafez is buried, the poet's tomb has become a pilgrimage site where visitors sit quietly in shaded gardens and read the divan or his collected works. Here is a fresco from a small chamber inside the Shahil Satun Palace in the garden of the Hafizia, which glows with transcendent symbolism of wine expressed so well by Hafiz. Drink wine, for if eternal life is to be obtained in the world, its only source is the wine of paradise. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Metzinger. And would like to ask uh, Mr. Ayler to start uh, uh, with the discussion. We'll begin with some questions now. I hope in the public they will also ask. <laughs> But let me to begin with one question, because you spent one part of your life in India, as I know, and about the Islamic culture in, in, in India, and what, do, what they do there, and what they do in Pakistan later. Do you have any comment about this? Sorry, uh, in comparison to Pakistan? Yes, with, uh, with Pakistan, because they are the same you nation. Right now? I think from 1947 when they divided to two oh, countries. So your and question? now my question is uh, the Islam 
in India. You see, I, you spend some time yes, there, yes, and yes. you know this Islam, this kind of Islam, and this kind of culture. What they built there, and what they built in, in Pakistan. Now I'm talking on the, for the last six decades, since the independence of Pakistan and, mm -hmm. and, and India. Well, um, it, it is one nation, you know. And, yes, one and, nation. And, and the hatred, uh, I mean, you have it in the Balkans, it can be m worse than if you have two different uh, uh, nations. But uh, Islam in India is, is uh, when I say India, the, the subcontinent, is very different from Islam in other places because um, Islam was one of those religions that took what it found and and built on there. I mean, um, in, in Iran, it took uh, from the Saf from the uh, from the early rulers. In in Egypt, it took from Christians and so on. In uh, in India, and it took from Hindus. And the early mosques are really like Hindu uh, use rebuilt uh, Hindu monuments. Um, I know that isn't your question. You're trying to get me into political, right? No, 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 no. It's not political. It's only no. the Islamic culture in India and Pakistan. The difference is 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 different. Yeah. It's very different. Yes, just like the Islam in Bosnia is in Kosovo is totally different from any Islam in the Middle East, because these the, they are not um, they are not uh, Arabs. These are Slavs, just like Muslims in India are really converted Hindus. They took Islam because um, it offered a possibility of um, of uh, getting ahead. Of uh, you know, it was uncomplicated. Hindus have such a system of uh, a caste system. You're born into something and you never come out of it. And Islam gave them that hope of. Uh, of freedom, so a lot of them converted, and hence they don't have that Arab mentality. It it is not a Muslim mentality. Uh, is that? Thank you. So it's the same in yes. India. It's a Hindu mentality. Now, what's happening, uh, you know, these days with Pakistan and so on? I I I personally don't think that has really much to do with Islam. I think this uh, question of Al Qaeda and so on, I don't want to get into that, but I don't think that has anything to do with it's just unfortunate, an unfortunate incident, and in that, that we've had the same thing, just like Hitler being, uh, you know, in a Christian country. That's. Thank you. Do you have any question? Yes, please. Yes, hello. Um, I would like to ask one question uh, in the frame of architecture. Can you speak up, please? I would like to ask one question in the frame of architecture as I understand yes. this is your civilization. So, as you may know, within Islam is not one very, how to say, um, uh, how do I say, sim simplified system. There are a lot of uh, um, sections within it, a lot of different points of view. One you mentioned, for example, Shia, Sunni, and so on. I did uh, uh, So, but there are more than this. We have, I don't know, the Gulf, which is a Wahhabism, and so on. I'm sorry, I'm not getting your question too well. Mm -hmm. Is there a microphone? Or, uh, or, so or do you want to come up, perhaps? <laughs> 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 Or you? Or close okay. Thank, Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, because I don't see Islam as one uh, like completely unified religion. As you mentioned before, there are a lot of differences. You have Sunnis on one side, you have Shia, and even and so many Sunnis, different Shia. Yeah, yes. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of uh, let's say sects. Okay. And I would like to ask uh, if we think in frame of architecture or of mosques, if, if this difference is is it different? Flat in also buildings of mosques. And it's true. And, yeah. and especially I'm asking about, let's say, uh, Xi in the Iran and the Gulf states. And if you could tell me also something about the architecture that came, Islamic architecture that Whether came it's to Europe 
in the 20th century, if you see any predominant style or where does it come from and so on? Yeah, it's a very good question, actually. <laughs> and the answer to that is that the mosque design never changed. No matter what they did, it always stayed the same. You could not, um, you could not introduce any new designs in a mosque. You had to follow the old rules. If you wanted to introduce new ideas in architecture, you had to do it in secular buildings because the mosque or the tomb always look the same. And the mosque, even these humongous mosques that they built in the Gulf these days, still are of the same structure. They do not change. You can't have any living beings on there. You know that because only God can create. But that prohibition is only for religious monuments. You can do what you like with secular monuments, and you saw on the manuscripts that I showed you many, many uh, you know, human beings. It's only for religious monuments that that prohibition holds. But there is no change. And if you look at, uh, I'm always amazed, uh, I was in Qatar last winter lecturing, that they have these huge mosques there in the Gulf, and they, they have to follow the same structure as the old ones. What about in Europe, uh, the new buildings that are coming in the mosque? You can't change a mosque. You can't make a mosque like churches, you know, one cross or something. It has to be the same. I haven't seen that many new uh, mosques even. I've just come, I was in Sarajevo before here, and even there, I don't, I don't think I saw any. Are there any new mosques there? No? Yes, you have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there is one, one, yeah. one, one, one mosque yes, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, no, I think it's, uh, it is, it's uh, the Gulf style. But even the Gulf style uh, is so still the same. It's yeah, just same, bigger. Bigger, yes. Yeah. Bigger, that's all. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Milan Yazbitz. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Uh, again for this very interesting presentation. I will have the following question. Uh, what will be, according to, to your opinion, the most important uh, styles or characteristics of Islam in art or in uh, architecture, comparing, for example, with this in uh, Orthodox or Catholicism? I mean, you know, uh, what would be this? What would define Islam architecture, let's say, from some, some other one, but not having in mind, of course, when you see a mosque, you know that is Islam, but are, are there any element, elements in, in Islam architecture or is, Islamic art which would define this religion and not the other one? Which, you mentioned simplicity, you said everything in Islam is simple. Uh, uh, are there any uh, such characteristics which would define this way of art or Art reflecting Islam, uh, just, just, just per se, as such? Uh, I don't quite uh, see the question. Do you, do you mean um, what would characterize Islamic, uh, what characteristics Islamic architecture would have that another architecture would not have? Yeah, for example, when I have a look, when I look at the, the picture, mm -hmm. and are there any characteristics which would say this reflects uh, uh, mm -hmm. Islam architecture. Of course, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. when I see a mosque, I know that it, it's yeah. this, but if I look at the picture as such, for example, are there mm -hmm. any characteristics which would define uh, uh, art expressing Islam mm -hmm. or are, are there? Uh -huh. I, I, see your, I see your question. Well, let's look at the decoration. I think... Um, but, I mean, you can have that on Western, um, or for that matter, Eastern uh, architecture, too. Um, as I said before, not having any human elements, not having any sculpture. Although, even that's not true, because of the early caliphs had lots of sculpture in their palaces. But then... 
I think we must remember what I said before, that Islam takes what it sees. In other words, the early caliphs were in Baghdad and, and, and um, you know, Assyria and so on, and they still had, in Syria, Greek tradition and Roman tradition, so they also built. But, um, so it's very, it's very difficult, really, to say that, um, because in different parts of the Islamic world, different, is the, the decoration, it may all be more or less the same, but it, it's different. In other words, in, if you know what I mean, you weren't allowed to have human beings, but in some parts of the Islamic world, they were more, uh, they were better able to, uh, to, to uh, use the decoration, to make the decoration. No, I think one of the main things is that it's the same, the similarity. You can look at uh, decoration even in all parts of uh, the Islamic world and see it the same. The flowers, you know, the scrolls, uh, the infinite scrolls. Now, they had a reason, those infinite scrolls. They weren't just scrolls. They were used to meditate. They were meant for people to meditate. I mean, I could... We've closed it now. No, no. You know, the, uh, the arabesque. So I was just going to show you the arabesque, the intertwined... Uh, well, we can't go backwards. Sorry. It, it'll, it'll take too long to... Uh, yeah. You describe this one, but I actually... Let me just, if I can quickly find... This one? Uh, here's one, I don't know if we can... It doesn't really show up here. For instance, here, this is one I didn't show you, which you might like to see. It's a, it's a garden of, uh, it's a carpet, and it's a garden, garden of paradise, and many of the carpets are laid out this way. And, and, and if, if you were able to see it better, if there were less light, you would see that there are scrolls and so on, which intertwine. And this is something that you would find on carpets, on ceramics. Um, um. Yes, please. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Isidro Fleischmann, and I have a question about West's opinion on Islam as a religion. Um, you mentioned that Islam was seen as a threat to uh, the Western states, mm -hmm. uh, and I have, a, and it still is now. Uh, I think there is quite aggressive politics led, uh, especially to the Middle East, uh, Islam. And I have a question: Is Islam really something we should be afraid of? I mean, what? Why? Why are we afraid of it? Why are the Western uh, states? Of today or today. historically? Today, especially today. Well, <laughs> I guess um, they equate Islam with um, with terrorism. You know, like George Bush did, uh, and and they are f afraid of um, attacks as are going on in Pakistan and and Afghanistan. Um, uh, that certainly is, is one fear, but traditionally in this part of the world, uh, the people were afraid of the Ottomans, the Turks. They had nothing to be afraid of because if you read the history books, they were better off under the Turks than they were. It's like uh, Tito's Yugoslavia, you know, when the, when the, the Turks left, uh, it all fell apart. The Turks were very good. I mean, they allowed, they, they imposed, you perhaps didn't have the freedom that you had, but they were very tolerant rulers. They allowed all religion and so on. They were nothing to be afraid of. Uh, certainly, uh, um, your question is, uh, 
I mean, if you ask the average European or American what they're most afraid of, they will say Al-Qaeda and, and, and the terrorists. And that is seen as a real threat, whether it's true or whether it has to do with uh, um, that is what they would say. That is the fear. I don't know if that's answering your question, is it? I hope you enjoyed uh, this lecture and discussion uh, as much as I did. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Merkinger for her uh, contribution to better understanding of the Islam and, and the Islamic uh, uh, architect. And thank you all for coming uh, and for taking part in this fruitful uh, discussion. At the end, I would like to invite you all uh, to our next lecture which will take place probably 19 November at 4 o'clock. Our guest uh, will be member of European Parliament from Slovenia, Mrs. Tanya Fajon. The lecture will be in Slovene. Uh, welcome. Thank you.